It's my great privilege to welcome up on our platform this morning, Andrew and Leah Postema. They have been uh, really good friends of mine. They helped take care of me in college uh, <laughs> before Lisa was around. Um, between Andrew and Leah and Dan and Megan, uh, another couple uh, that we got together with, they helped uh, with my wardrobe. Um, I grew up with brothers out in Norton, and so there's... I love Norton, but I didn't have fashion, and so there are some, I still don't have fashion, by the way, but um, they really kept me in line between girls and fashion and so many other parts of my... I don't know if we want to take responsibility or credit or just celebrate how far God has brought all of us. That's right. That's right. (laughs) God has been good to us. Uh, Our church, West Hill, has supported... Uh, financially in prayer, uh, and as I've said so often, I believe our missionaries are an extension of who we are, right? Our missionaries aren't like child support where we just send them money. Missions shouldn't be looked at that way. We appreciate what they do more than just sending them funds. We want to see our missionaries as an extension of our staff, so they're like staff members to us. And so we've been supporting this since April of 2007, which is hard to believe it's been that long. Um, but uh, we, we've been blessed. Lisa and I were able to go and spend some time uh, over in Romania with them in Bucharest a number of years ago now. Uh, and I think we're ready to go back and, and catch we're up. Ready and, too. And, uh, but what they have to share with you this morning, uh, I believe, will be very powerful. It'll be very uh, encouraging to you. But it'll be convicting, too, as we see the needs of the world and, and through the lens of, of people who have been on the front lines uh, there in Romania and all that's gone on with Ukraine, but also through their camp ministry and reaching young people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it really is a treat to have you guys here. And so we want to welcome them. Would you welcome with me Andrew and Leah Postema? Thank you, brother. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. It is our joy and it's our privilege to be back home at West Hill. Uh, We love being here because it's encouraging. It's encouraging to see familiar faces and to see the way that God has brought us along and carried us through. Uh, It's good to see new faces, um, people who have been coming over in the recent last couple of years when we have, have not been here. Um, it's good to think about those who, who we'd love to see who aren't with us anymore. And, uh, It's good to be back. So thank you for welcoming us. We are in Romania. And we've been there for almost 18 years now, uh, serving the Lord primarily in camp ministry, leadership training, and then recently being involved in ministry to uh, those from Ukraine who are seeking refuge in Romania and going in and helping there. We want to we want to share with you a little bit about the work that God is doing. First, a little bit of family update and then camp ministry and developments with the camp property that God has given us and also Ukraine and then a message uh, to be an encouragement to you hopefully today. The past three years, it's been Leah and Wayne and myself because the girls uh, grew up and, and went away to college and got married. And so it's just been the three of us in Romania together. Uh, when we came back in September, we tried to get together and have a family picture. Um, and you can get one of these pictures in the back to put on your refrigerator and pray for our family. But it immediately became out of date because this happened. A week later, we welcomed Andy Hope into our family. Um, she is beautiful and wonderful, and I am an ex- we are excited grandparents. Um, and so we praise the Lord for a safe delivery, and mom and baby are doing great. And so if that wasn't enough, the next thing you know, two weeks ago... Rose got engaged. So we're planning a wedding now, and um, we'll be having a wedding before we head back to Romania. So if you want to get a prayer card that just has the two of us on it, (laughs) that's what we have for right now. And you can trust us that we'll continue to update it. Uh, And also getting a picture with Wayne. uh, The picture that he's most proud of is this animal that he harvested. Wayne had never been deer hunting. And there's a lot of things that we aren't able to do because we're in Romania most of the time. And so he's like, Dad, I want to try hunting. Well, this is his first, this is his third day out hunting. And uh, he harvested the buck of a lifetime in, 
in his first attempt. So um, he came down with us. He went back to the Varner's house. He's feeling sick these past few days. So maybe at the end of the service. He has a head cold. It's not the flu. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, he doesn't have the flu. But um, So he's back with us now. He finished high school. Do you want to update on Wayne? Yeah. He's um, actually tomorrow. He starts at community college. He took a semester off to kind of acclimate. The transition back to the United States is often difficult for MKs, and he got his driver's license. He obviously harvested a deer. Um, he's been doing some other small handiwork jobs, and so he starts school tomorrow. You can pray for him as he does that. In Romania, we continue to be involved with camps. We help to lead camps for kids. We've done this for many years. Uh, here's a, a group of kids at a camp for for young people that we re, we rent and use. We also are involved in camps for teenagers and preteens. Uh, it's been neat to see Wayne go from being a, a camper and a helper uh, to being a counselor at camp to being responsible for his own group of boys. Here he is with a group of boys headed out on a hike and then on the top of a mountain. Dad, we need to play a game while we're up here. Go ahead, you lead the game. So. This is what he came up with. And there's a group picture on the top of the mountain. Here he is with Matei, who is one of the, he's a, a child, a son of one of the, his parents were some of our first campers when we first went to Romania. They came to the first camps that we ever did, and now they're sending their son, and this is Wayne with one of his campers. Our primary responsibilities have changed over the years as we've been able to work with young people and raise them up in the camp philosophy that we have. And so our, our primary responsibility these days is with training and then also just with making sure that um, the programs are written, devotionals are written, program directors are ready to lead the programs. So this summer in particular, I worked uh, very closely with all of our program directors to make sure that those things happened um, and the programs were written, devotionals writing, and um, all the materials are bought and we're ready to go when it's time for camp. Um, and that was a great privilege and a joy as always to work alongside these young people that are passionate about camp ministry. And um, that's what happens when you grow up a culture of kids in the camp ministry. They, they, they grasp that passion for it and they wanna see it happen and they wanna see it happen well. And so we've uh, just are privileged to work with these young people who, um, who love camp as much as we do. And so we also do the training and the foundational aspect of making sure that they're equipped to share the gospel and to show Christ's love to campers and to know how to interact in an effective way. Uh, but we also do care just to make sure everyone has the coffee they need and the, the prayer time in the morning to help everyone be ready for the spiritual effort of doing camp. Camp is fun, but it's more than just fun. Uh, so we're very thankful for the continued involvement in camp and ask that you'd pray with us as we think about what God has for us in the future. We've developed specialists who are good at doing camps, and now he's bringing us to, to teach in new places, and that's pretty exciting. We're also responsible for oversight of a project called the Pact Romania Ministry Center, and that is a place where we're developing a camp and conference center of our own. The word pact means the same thing in English as it does in Romanian. A pact means that a good relationship has been formed and that people have come together and something healthy is happening. And so we're creating a place where people can discover good relationships and develop good relationships uh, with people around them and with their creator, God. When we first went, there was nothing on this piece of property. Uh, we had 22 acres of land, and um, we're very thankful for the property that God has given us. It's a beautiful piece of land. Uh, there's a lake on the, on the property that we enjoy, and uh, this is the, the view from, from up above. And I bring it to your attention because uh, you have been praying and some of you have given generously for a little piece of property on the far end of this lake right mm -hmm. here. And we want to thank you for uh, the giving that you have done. We're praying for the seller, the owner of that property to turn into a seller. Uh, we're 
we're eager for that to happen. There's some things that need to fall into place before that will happen. Um, but thank you for giving generously to the uh, Legacy of Land campaign that happened, I don't think it was a year ago, I think two years ago. Um, this is, is that property. I'm standing on the dam that helps to create the lake and there's a beautiful walnut tree. And we look across the water and pray frequently that God will give us that piece of land. And we thank God for you for helping us get closer to making it happen. And here's another piece, another picture of that area. Taco is out playing fetch on the frozen pond and we love ice skating there. So thank you for being with us uh, to help make that happen. The other thing that we talked about uh, last time we were here, we were getting ready to bring a shipping container from America to Romania. And this is that shipping container that we loaded in Lowell, Michigan at one of our sending churches. And um, it made it, and that has enabled, to do, uh, enabled us, it, it brought us a lot of things and enabled us to do a lot of things. Here's Wayne on unloading day, uh, trying to get the ATV loose. There's a bunch of beds up there, toboggans. There's a big Kubota tractor. Uh, and we stayed up basically all night uh, unloading that, that thing. And it gave us the equipment that has allowed us to bring utilities into the property, to the areas where we need them. Here's Wayne. Uh, he dug a hole with a backhoe and Taco is doing an inspection to make sure that everything is just the way that it should be. And this is running water uh, in the center of our camp property. Since this picture was taken, we've brought it to the place where the water main is. And there's nothing like having good, clean water on your property. So we're very thankful because it makes it easier for guests to be with us. And we have electricity run from the, from the community that we're close to. And it's, those are big steps. We're very thankful for that. Uh, we've been very thankful to have Wayne with us. Um, he uh, is a mechanic, and he started his mechanical training when we were home last time for furlough. And um, he has read all of the owner's manuals cover to cover for the vehicles that we have out there. And um, as you, some of you probably know, when you have a tractor, it probably is going to break down. And when you're doing work for the Lord, that happens frequently. So uh, we are very thankful for Wayne because he fixes all of the things and keeps us running. Um, here he is. He's trying to fix something on the tractor uh, late at night. Doesn't matter. He's out there. He's working on it. Um, we're not exactly sure what we're going to do when he, if he decides to stay here um, without him out there. We don't know what we're going to do. Andrew's going to have to learn how to do it, I guess. Um, yeah. So he, he does a lot of work, uh, but he also enjoys the benefits. Here he is uh, up on one of the platforms uh, with Captain, one of our dogs. He's getting a tent set up so that we'll be able to uh, have his youth group come out and have a day at the packed Romania Ministry Center. And that was, a, that was a beautiful day together. So we brought that container over, and it enables us to do a lot of things. We're able to, to make good progress and see God working, uh, but it also, things don't always run smoothly. This is uh, in June, we're trying to get ready to start building a building and move in some dirt and we had a team coming and it rained just about every day. So we're basically moving mud and the big tractor was broken down. So we're using the small tractor, but as we're using the small tractor and pulling mud around, we're pulling too much dirt, more than we should, and the, the wheel of the tractor gets a flat tire, and it's about to tip over the edge of a steep part of the property, so we had to use a chain attached to the ATV just to hold the whole thing in place, and here's Wayne in the background wheeling that tire away to go, to go fix things. So things don't always go smoothly, and progress isn't what we'd like, uh, but we just keep moving forward as best we can. Part of that not going the way that we expected. We were praying and we continue to pray that God gives us the rezoning of our master plan and that he gives us the permits that we need to start building. Uh, our first building we thought was gonna be this. Last time we were here, God's people gave generously and we have the funds to build a building, but we don't have permission yet from our town hall. So 
in the conversations about what's it going to take, how do we move forward, what can we do, we understood that we can't pour a concrete foundation because they just won't let us. But they'll let us pour concrete pylons that we can build on. So we started thinking, all right, what's possible? What can we do? What design could we make for a building? We need to start with something where we can have a toilet that flushes and showers amen, that amen, work. toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we came up with a design, the ABWE project office, uh, office helped us with a design for a building that'll be our utility building. There's a little space down here for our electrical main and our water main comes right to this building. And we decided to go for it. So this is the start of the project. Just that muddy spot that you saw a minute ago. And Wayne and his friend Andre, uh, we went at it. First, they're building the concrete rebar cages that go in the hole with the concrete surrounding them. And then a team of men came over to help get started on it. And here's Wayne learning how to mix cement and, and he got to be the master. We had a pallet of, I think, 80 bags of cement and we went through just about all of them. Digging those holes and we put beams across each set of four or five. Four that were on the corners of the property and, or the building and one down the center. We put a deck on it and went to town. This is just a matter of a few days. We made tremendous pro progress. They were with us for, for three weeks. We got walls up. There's Wayne standing on top of one of them and a roof going on. There's Wayne, happy to be in the building. He's thinking about what it's going to be like to have a roof over his head that's not a camper or a tent. Or a car. Or a car. Yeah, he slept in a van quite a bit. And we're putting the roof on. And here's Wayne. And I included this picture to prove that safety matters because he's wearing a harness. See that? That's for the grandmothers or the mothers <laughs> who are observing and also it's important that one guy wears a harness because then he's the one who can keep everyone else safe. <laughs> There's Wayne putting the roofing on. And it was really tremendous to be involved with this group of guys who had skills, physical skills, but it was all for a spiritual purpose because all they wanted is to see something built that would be used uh, in a way that would have eternal consequences, to, to be the place where people would come and make that connection with their creator or relationship with other good people. It's interesting what Pastor Aaron was saying about the physical bread. Like we can touch it, we can taste it, we have physical bodies. Christ came in a physical body and uh, these places aren't just a physical thing, they're a physical thing where a spiritual thing happens and, and we are united, so it's neat. Here's Wayne, after they, the team had left, Wayne had one of his uh, friends come out, their family came and we put insulation on the inside of the building. Here we are getting ready to put um, the foam insulation on the exterior and then we put mud over the top of that. So we had, how many men? 20 some men from church come and help us on that day. Um, it was great to have our church in Bucharest out to, to make this happen. One of the men, he's a builder, he helped Wayne understand how the, the sills need to go under the windows and keep the water out of the frame of the building. And then after they left, Wayne and I finished it up and there it is with mud on the outside. So that's how we left it when we um, came back to the States in September. And there it is at night. And in the midst of all this, um, this war started happening in our neighborhood. So Ukraine is right next door. We are in Bucharest and our home is just about right down here. And so um, when the Russian forces invaded Ukraine in February of 2021, um, the next day we had people show up at our church looking for a place to stay, looking for a welcome, a warm welcome. Um, and so our church had to evaluate, how do we respond? What do we do? What do you know, this is going to be 
No one knows what this is going to be, but it could be huge. Uh, but there's definitely needy people, and we need to figure out how we respond to our neighbors. Um, thankfully, in our church, we have a man named Alexei. He's on the right side here. Um, he is from a region of Moldova that's as close as you can get to Odessa, Ukraine, without being in Ukraine, on the Moldova side. He's from that, that area of Moldova. And he also, he, growing up there, he uh, went to the seminary that's in the capital city of Chisinau. And so he taught there uh, at the seminary. And so he had a lot of connections. He knew a lot of pastors. And so he and I went um, about, well, it was within the first week of the war to see what was happening and to talk with pastors like this man whose church is literally two miles away from the border and to see and to understand all that was happening there. This is where that area is. That little arrow is in Palanca is the name of that community. And the border comes right into um, Ukraine. And there were thousands and thousands of people who were trying to seek refuge in Moldova and to come into Romania and to come to Poland at that time because um, the Russians started sending missiles and bombing and invading and doing everything they could to destroy um, Ukraine, to take over, to set up a, a puppet government uh, and to make Ukraine part of the Soviet empire again. So we went to go see what could happen, to distribute some funds and to find out how we could help. And while we were there, this is the first refugee family that we helped, uh, a mom and her son. Uh, she's in her mid forties and she had a son who wanted to go to trade school. And one of the things I promise you is that if you come to Ukraine and start meeting people, you'll meet someone who looks like your family or your friends or the people that you know and love. Um, and I'll never forget, she said, I pray I just pray that God will never allow your children to see the things that our children have seen with their own eyes. Uh, pretty powerful. So we, we helped them. Uh, we brought them safely to where uh, they could get some help in the, in the churches in Moldova. They had left Odessa that morning. The, the way that it usually worked is people would spend all night in the basement in the bomb shelter. They couldn't go out onto the streets until 8 a.m. when the curfew happened and then people would start driving or getting bussed or walking to, toward the border. It's about 40 kilometers or 40 miles from Odessa to the border. And I remember her saying, we're so thankful that we got a bus that brought us halfway there and then we only had to walk about 18 miles. So with that information, uh, Andrew went back to our church and said, we need to start um, going to the border and helping people come into Romania. So our church, along with six other churches in the area, um, formed what's called um, UBC. And um, it was basically the union of Baptist churches to help Ukrainian churches and Ukrainians. So we started convoys. Um, I think the most vehicles we've had on a convoy was 12, 12 vans of people that we would just drive up through Moldova, through um, south of Chisinau into Polanka and uh, pick up people at the border. We had relationships with the church and the pastor there. That pastor had good relationship with the border guards, the border police, and they trusted us. So we were able to um, go and bring people to the centers that our churches were, were leading. Our church in Bucharest um, transformed into a center, a refugee center. All of the classrooms got made into bunk rooms. Um, we had a restaurant that supplied meals for three months um, for the church because the kitchen was about the size of this community table. Um, and so uh, there, we just had a lot of help, a lot of hands, a lot of volunteers. We would be at the border close to Odessa into Moldova and we would uh, receive primarily women and children uh, because the men weren't allowed to leave the country. They're still not allowed to leave Ukraine. Um, if they're 18 through I think 55, they can't leave. So it was a lot of moms, a lot of families, uh, a lot of um, teenagers who were actually traveling with their, with their grandparents. and. Um, just so many needy people, and, and we'd pick them up and then drive all night to get them back to Bucharest. 
Um, I only went on two trips, the first couple, couple trips. Um, it was good to have a woman in the mix because there were women, they were picking up women and there's all these men drivers, but they would see me with that group and they say, well, if she's going, I will go because it must be safe if there's a woman with you. Um, trafficking is a real, is a real issue with refugees. But um, I met this woman, her name is Yana, and um, she's a high school math teacher. And uh, she had her son with her. They had left uh, their father and husband, her sister and her sister's son and their mother. So there were a group of five and they rode in our vehicle uh, on the way home. And I just, when I saw her, I just felt the Holy Spirit telling me that, that she just needed a hug. And so I just hugged her and she just broke down and wept. And she's just like, I, you have no idea what we've been through. You have no idea how terrifying this is. I, it's just, we're, I'm so scared and I don't know what to do. And I left my husband there and um, they live in an area called Nikolaev, which was uh, heavily right close to the front of the war and um, heavily bombed area. And her husband was there. And so I, I kept in touch with her. I, I, she spoke pretty good English. And so I saw her the next day at the center and we talked about what her plans were. They went to Bulgaria. I kept in contact. We would WhatsApp all the time. And I asked her one day, I'm like, how are you really doing? She's like, well, we, we really need help. There's nobody out down here to help us. I can't, I don't know where to exchange my money. I don't know where to buy toothpaste. I don't, we don't, we came with all of our winter baggage, but it's summer now and we don't have any clothes to wear. And I'm like, ugh. So I connected her with other missionaries in Bulgaria and they went down and helped her and they actually found a home for her to live in and that she ended up helping them in the refugee ministry because she could speak both languages. And, um, and then she went back to Ukraine um, last summer to be with her husband because she had been away for so long. And um, I still talk to her. In fact, a few weeks ago, there was heavy bombing in Kiev and that's where they are currently. And I, I just checked in with her. I'm like, are you okay? I saw that there was bombing. And, and she's constantly saying things to me like, when will this end? How long do we have to live like this? How long, how long does this have to go on? And I, I often wonder what it would be like to live in a state of alert for so long. And just the trauma that that causes in lives. I pray for her, pray for her family. Her husband's name is Andrew. Um, and Yana is her name. Her son's name is Alexei. And um, we've had good spiritual conversations, but I am not exactly sure if she is a true believer. Um, so she talks about praying, she talks about God, and she believes in, in him, but um, whether or not she has a relationship with him is a different story. So please be in prayer for Yana and her family. The first few months... Uh, we were primarily focused on helping to get people out. And so here I am with a, a group of drivers who was going in. We have one young lady who, uh, who's coming out. Um, we use the word refugee because it's convenient sometimes. We usually prefer to say neighbors or guests or friends um, because refugee kind of puts distance between um, these people. So will interchange all those words. Uh, but we would be uh, going once, sometimes twice a week, we'd get a call, hey, there's a lot of people here who need to be brought out, can you come? So it was once a week or twice a week, helping people to get out. And then a few months in, in the middle of April, beginning of May, we started going in with vans full of uh, humanitarian aid to, to help, to give to people who were without, and we would distribute at churches. So here's a group of guys that we brought in. This is my son-in-law, Riley. They're kind of in the middle of the, the three guys. And we brought all kinds of food. Uh, this, these are diapers and, and uh, baby food to bring to a crisis pregnancy center in Odessa. Here's the church that we would, uh, one of the churches that we visit. And the the food items would go into a warehouse, um, a storage place. Uh, there's a few different places that we go into Ukraine. And then what happens is people who have need, who are displaced, will come to the church a few times a week. There'll be services where there's a gospel presentation, a time of prayer. And then after that, people um, register. Usually they've 
registered in advance that they will come that day. And then they kind of sign in and they're given a bag uh, of food items. And this little grocery bag has flour and sugar and salt and coffee. Uh, there's usually a thing of oil. Um, there's some canned food. This one, it's interesting, it has a home canned vegetable of some kind and there's tuna fish uh, and some type of sausage that'll hold up. Um, and they're able to come once every two weeks to get a bag. The, one of the churches that we work with has a table uh, for, for young mo mothers of young children uh, to, to meet those needs as well. And there'll be a, usually a, a place where a kid can get a teddy bear or something because sometimes they, they didn't make it. Andrew always travels with stickers to give to kids. Yeah, I give them a little sheet of, of stickers. It's an easy thing to fit in a backpack. And we bring generators um, and we bring whatever we can uh, to help people in need. Uh, during the first six months, our church and several other churches got turned into refugee centers. And we had over 3,500 people stay with us. And they stayed for about A total of over 2,500 nights. So in all of those visits and all those people, if you count nights, 2,500 nights, in that time period, in six months, our team did 27 convoys to Ukraine or to the border. Um, over 170 tons of product was brought into Ukraine via, our, via UBC. And UBC is this, the, the six churches and three organizations, one of which is ABWE, which we're a part of. Um, in 10 months, we saw 3,500 nights. Um, the guys did 281,000 kilometers and 42 convoys, um, helping uh, 70,000 people in Ukraine. Uh, those are just some of the, the statistics not to toot our own horn or anything but to let you know that the people we're working with are serious about helping refugees um, one of the things that we don't talk about is the fact that uh, once the israel war started in israel um, 200 uh, israelis refugees showed up via flight um, and our church picked them up at the airport um, so it's not just about, and when, when the earthquake happened in Turkey, our church went and helped, and they helped build structures to house refugees or house the people who lost their homes. And so it's not just about Ukraine anymore. It's about seeing the world around us and where we can help as a church. I think the hard part is that, um, like, we know people personally, and so... We see that side of it. Um, and we know you personally, and, and we see the connection. And we just do our little part. We all do our part, though. When we all do our part, a lot can happen. I can drive. I can lead people in. Um, but the ladies in the church cooked the meals and did the laundry and the men in the church installed showers in places where you wouldn't have expected to shower because people need to shower and they installed so many washers and dryers and and the young people moved so many boxes of food and uh, we each did our part and you're part of that and together God takes all the little parts and he does something big we were able to, we were asked to help with a camp for refugee kids in Ukraine. Um, and I would say we had the opportunity to learn about how to do camp with refugee kids. And um, there were something like 40 campers who came and at least half of them, uh, if not three quarters of them were kids who had been displaced by the war, who were relocated. Um, whose homes had been destroyed. One brother and sister, they had their house hit again, bombed again, while they were with us at camp. 
They had family members who were uh, fighting and they had people who they loved, who, who they had lost. Um, and we were together for a week and we had a week at camp in which there was peace and there was fun and there was joy. And it was a, it was a really tremendous equipment. These leaders were some of the best leaders that I've ever worked with uh, because they really got it. They really understood how to love these campers because some of them uh, were refugees themselves. So be with us in prayer, please. Continue to, to do your part and the work that God is doing. Uh, pray for peace in Ukraine and pray for restoration. Pray for uh, hope for people who are living without hope. Pray for the future of the camp ministry as we sort out how to um, look at new opportunities and still be solid and supportive of the opportunities that God has given us over the years. Pray for the PAC to Romania Ministry Center that God would continue to allow us to, to move forward. We do want to build more cabins. We need help to do that. So think about coming over and helping to build uh, to help make it happen. Uh, we need teammates because we've only got about 20 years left before we're done in Romania. So we're maybe halfway there. I don't know. Uh, we need people to come alongside and join us, though, in the work. And pray for a spiritual renewal. Um, it was, it's been a lot over these past few years. And uh, we need to... And we are experiencing healing and, and strengthening through this time here. Pray for our family. When we go back, it'll be maybe empty nest time, and that'll be different. Uh, we're leaving a little baby girl uh, behind and a newly wed couple and Wayne. We don't know where he's going to be. So uh, pray for our family as well. Anything else you want to say? Okay. I'm going to give you a word of encouragement. Um, from the book of 2 Corinthians. Unshakable hope for hard times is what I'm calling this because God in his uh, good provision brought me to the book of 2 Corinthians before the trouble in Ukraine started. And it was his perfect timing, the way that he arranges things. I don't know if that has ever happened to you, that God brought you the passage that you needed in a timely manner. Because as I was helping people get out and connecting with people in the country who were going through such devastation, such difficult times, such darkness, I felt like, what do I have to say? What do I have to offer? How do, I, how do I give anything to these people who've lost so much and have such uncertainty in their lives? And God brought me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 11. Uh, but before we read them, I just want to talk about some of the words that we're going to find here. The first word is hardship. In your English Bible, you might see the word suffering, or you might see the word affliction, because it's used, those words are used seven different times in this little section, okay? And each of those words relate to this idea of being pressed down and crushed, okay? They're words that the Bible uses elsewhere to talk about crushing grapes in order to make wine. They're talking about grinding something down until only the pulp remains and all the life-giving juice is pushed out of it. And that's what some of us experience uh, when we go through hard times. And that's what these Ukrainian friends, neighbors of ours were experiencing. And that's something that is familiar to all of us. When I think of this word of being pressed or crushed, I think about these crowds of people who were just trying to get across the border and a tent had been sent up, set up because it was cold wintertime outside and they were trying to get through so they could get to something that they didn't know what it would be, but they hoped that it would be more safe than the devastation that they left behind. I think of trying to squeeze in as many people as we possibly could. When we were filling our vans with women and children and older folks and we might have had nine seatbelts, but we had 12 or 15 people in each vehicle. And we squeezed in as many as we could 
because we didn't want this to happen where we were loaded up, ready to go, and there was one more family and we didn't have any place for them. That'll really crush you if you have to drive away because you wanna offer hope to people. You wanna give them something that they don't have and we're gonna find the word hope two times in this passage and it describes this hope as an unshakable hope a hope that is firm and solid it's a hope that's based on who Christ is it's a sure confidence of deliverance and when I think of hope I think about this sign that's that's in the foyer of our church in Bucharest when we would bring these people in and they saw this sign that said welcome you are safe here when we were traveling, driving all night, it was with people who, who didn't know what they might find, what journey God was bringing them on. They didn't know where they would sleep that night or where their next meal would come from. But I had this hope. That when we walked in the doors, the ladies would have a hot meal and there would be a clean bed waiting for those who needed it and they would be there would be someone who would pray with them someone who spoke russian that way they could interact on a heart level there would be hope i knew it would be there because i knew where where we were going and that's what hope is confidence of the future i think about these campers who found hope because they were in a place where they were loved they were loved by Counselors who knew what it was like to go through the struggles that each one of them was facing. And it, they knew that they could create friends in a place that had been foreign to them because it wasn't like home. And the third word that we see here in this passage, the one that gets us from hardship and suffering and being pressed and squeezed to hope is the word that's translated as comfort. And we think of the word comfort and we think about being comfortable, being relieved, being relaxed. But that's not what this word means. This word that is used for comfort, it shows up 10 times in these verses and it means coming alongside or called alongside for encouragement. It means called alongside to be there, to give strength, to give healing words, to bring the support that will help someone get through. It's standing shoulder to shoulder it's being brothers in arms, comrades in a common battle. That's what the word comfort means. And when I think of this word, I think about this family that lives 50 miles from Odessa. And they've had thousands of people come through their home. I think of this young man who's responsible for his, his church in Ukraine uh, for the distribution. Well, he's, he's responsible for warehousing. The, the food and the items that we bring over. I think about this family that we came alongside and we helped the mom and her kids get out and the husband had to stay, the father had to stay. And a few months in, they said, boy, we'd love to go back and just have some family time together. So we brought uh, the mother and, and children back in to see their dad. We came alongside them and we helped them. And that's what it means to show the love of Christ and be an encouragement to people who are going through a hard time. So those are the key words. And sorry for being a mess today. You're getting the real thing. But I want to read these verses now that God has given us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Follow along. And as I read, I'm going to substitute those words. Suffering, hardship, hardship, affliction, comfort. I'm going to substitute different words for those. So you just follow along and, and think about this passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our affliction. Hold on. He comes alongside and strengthens us in all of the times we are crushed 
so that we can be called alongside to help those who are being crushed in any way with the companion care which we ourselves have been strengthened by from our Emmanuel. For as we share abundantly in being pressed like grapes for Christ, so through Christ we also share abundantly in coming alongside for healing fellowship. If we are crushed, it is for your strengthened companionship and salvation. And if we are encouraged in spirit, it is for your spirit to be encouraged, which you experience when you patiently endure the same pressing times in which we feel pressed like grapes. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you are sharing in our pressing moments, you, are, you will also stand shoulder to shoulder with us. For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the crushing times we experienced. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired even for life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received a death sentence. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope, and he will deliver us again. You also must help through prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. A few lessons that we've learned from this passage. First of all, evil is real. Paul's aware of it. We've seen it face to face in Ukraine. We've heard about it and seen October 7th in Israel, the invasion that happened there. Do you realize that was three months ago? And it was horrific and it was hideous and barbaric. We live in a world that's evil and that evil sometimes touches even our own lives, even our own families, our communities. And we as believers, as those who speak the truth, we have the language to talk about it. Because in the world today, it's sometimes really sensitive to say, oh, this is right and that's wrong. This is true, this is false. This viewpoint is right and that one's not. People are hesitant, but we have the language that allows us to see something that's evil and to say that is wrong, it's sinful, it is evil. And we need to acknowledge that and sometimes bring healing by calling sinful things sinful, evil things evil, and things that hurt us for what they truly are. And that we see in these opening verses. We also see that God's mercy is mediated by his people, most especially through Jesus Christ who came and walked on this earth and experienced the difficulties, the hardship. He knew what it was like to be pressed down. He knew what it was like to face evil. He knew what it was like to lose people that he loved and be betrayed by those he loved. And so he's the perfect one to mediate God's love. And he continues to show his love through his people he knows our pain, and if we are with him, if we are his people, we know comforting and healing and help through pain, and we can be equipped and capable of helping others. Those who have experienced God's comfort through hardship are most capable of helping others. Those who've already felt God's presence through a dark time are best prepared to share that hope and that light to others who are entering a dark time, who find themselves in a dark time. Our greatest encouragement comes from one who has experienced a hardship that's like the one that we've gone through. And these verses, they even say that the, our God is the God of all comfort. He comforts us all in our affliction so that we can help anyone who is in any affliction through the same help that we have received. So we have what it takes to help people who are struggling. And I think about these people in Ukraine who have um, gone through difficult times 
and found help and comfort and encouragement. And I think about churches and families here who are going through difficult times and face um, uncertainty about what the future brings. And thankfully, God has given us each other. One of the hard times that we went through while we were in Romania was finding out that my mother was dealing with cancer back here in the States. And um, talk about feeling powerless to help someone who's going through a hard time. What do you do? She even said, as we would talk on the phone, don't tell anyone. I don't want other people to know. I feel like it's a, a private thing. Oh, God, change my mother's heart, would you please? <laughs> and she, she shared with some of the ladies in her little Bible study group. And they rallied around her and they supported and encouraged her and helped her. And I was so thankful for the way that God brings those who have gone through those difficulties to help us through. And in the moments when we feel like there's no one who can understand what I'm going through right now, we have a Savior who faced evil and he faced loss and he faced hard times. And he can mediate love in those moments through his people. Another truth, another reality, I'll keep it moving, is that uh, the gospel belongs in the trenches. Life and death moments bring us to a God who has conquered death and gives life. The most needy people, the people who are most aware of their need for a savior are those who realize that they're desperate and they need deliverance. Uh, related to that, one of the questions that we hear all the time, um, is it dangerous to go into Ukraine? Yes, it is. Um, this, I don't know how well you can see this, this is a map that shows Ukraine and one month, September to November of last year, this is the track of all the missiles and rockets and drones that came from Russia into Ukraine. There's no safe place. The front lines obviously are the most dangerous place. We stay away from those. But anywhere you go, there's a risk of an attack. So how do you deal with that? Um, how could you go is one of the questions that we get asked. Well, how could we not go? If your neighbor is in need, do you help your neighbor? Um, you look at the story of the Good Samaritan. He saw the need. And the text tells us in Luke chapter 10 um, that he felt compassion and then he went to the dangerous place and he got off of his animal and he got down and he spent time with one who needed help. And so how can we not go into the dangerous places? Um, this is where we cross the Danube. Uh, we come up off the boat and as we drive up a ramp, we come to the, the place where they process us and allow us into the country. And this is that same place getting destroyed by rockets uh, at, at the end of September. And our men had just driven through there uh, a few weeks ago, or a few weeks before that. This is what it looked like from the, from the Romania side. The gospel belongs there. And so we need to go. When we go, we go in a safe way. We go with the team. We have the equipment and supplies that we need. Uh, we can we have mechanics with us always. We always have someone who interprets into the Russian language. We always bring someone who's been there before. And we always have what we need when we go in. And then we have the responsibility when we come out to process through the difficulty that we have gone through. And that's an important part of doing dangerous things. If you're going to do dangerous things, you should do them safely and you should finish them well. So that's one of the lessons that we've learned. And then last of all, God invites us all to be involved. Everyone has a part in God's redemptive work. And he says that in verse 11. You all help by participating with your prayers. And we couldn't do it without you. We need you to be with us through prayer because that's part of the work that God has called every one of us to do. Some of us will go. Some of us will send. Some of us will pray. Some of us will give. But we should all do our part because together we can see God's hope, an unshakable hope brought to a world that needs to see evil for what it is and recognize that we have a savior who will deliver us from evil times. Thank you so much for being an encouragement to us and being a blessing to our family and by extension to our Romanian 
brothers and sisters in Christ and to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for, for being with us for God's work in Eastern Europe. Thanks, Andrew and Leah. I hope that you're encouraged. I know we're a little over time, but that's okay, right? You think about what we just heard versus what we experience every day. And I will say the easiness of our lives, right? I mean, we, we have trials. We've had hardships. Some of you are walking through that. That's not to make light of those. It's the reality that we each, every single day, walk through something. And yet, this gives us perspective. And what is the hope that we have? It's the gospel. We have that. We've been given that. You've heard the gospel today. If you've accepted the gospel, you believe in Jesus, take that with you. It's not for us to hold to ourselves. We're to go, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if it even costs you uh, your life, right? What, what would it cost you if you fully devoted your life in sharing the gospel? It may be minute, but do your part, right? God doesn't call all of us to the front lines of Ukraine, but he calls each of us to serve him and to love him with all of our heart. And so that's our responsibility. And so as we leave here today, I hope that your heart is encouraged. I hope that your heart is also convicted, challenged, that we may live faithfully to our Lord and Savior. Our life is short. Amen? We don't know when the end is. And so let's use every minute of every day for his glory. I thank Andrew for not putting that uh, yellow M sign throughout uh, <clears throat> this, this presentation. So uh, uh, <clears throat> we will pray for those who have gone the wayward way. But uh, um, I do want to pray, Andrew and Leah, if you would come with me and just stand here with me. And, Will you stand with me and let's pray with Andrew and Leah and for them and, uh, and ask the Lord's help as we leave from here today. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you work in each of our lives. Thank you for the partnership that you've given us with the Postuma family. And Lord, through them, you have continued to expand the gospel. Lord, there in Romania, through the camp ministry, we thank you so much for the the expansion of the camp ministry and, and how things have gone so well and smoothly to be able to run camps in so many different places and, and to have them done so well. And now to think about spreading and, and expanding their horizon to go to new places and, and new uh, opportunities to run camps for places that want to have that and, and desire to share the gospel with with campers and with students, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to direct them and guide them to, to the places that you want and to the places that you have prepared and ready, Lord, for camp ministry. Lord, we thank you for the pact, Lord, and for the land and the ministry there and for this new building. We pray for, Lord, future building there and for the land that needs to be purchased. We pray that you would soften the owner's heart and, Lord, that he would be willing to, to, uh, to even give that land, Lord, and to see your purpose for it. And, Lord, that you would just do uh, a miraculous event there. And, Lord, that they would have that land to go with what you've already provided. And that you will provide the builders and provide the, the men and, and, and the hands, the laborers that are needed to continue to keep uh, building and doing the things in order to prepare uh, that land for future camps, for future ministry, for eternal purposes, Lord, for your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you for the ministry that you have allowed Andrew and Leah and their church there in Ukraine, Lord, uh, or in Romania to minister in Ukraine. Lord, the, the amount of lives that they've been able to touch and have an impact on, Lord, it is... Uh, It is reality to us who live comfortably here, Lord, to be reminded of how close it hits to some of those who we love dearly, Lord, and how there is a needy world who needs their physical needs taken care of. And Lord, that also need to hear the hope of Jesus in the midst of that. And we thank you for the way that you've used 
Andrew and Leah, and Lord, their family, and also the, their church there. And we pray that you would continue to expand their ministry as they, as they reach out to these neighbors and friends, Lord, that you place before them, that they will continue to minister your love. And Lord, as we think about that in our lives, Lord, there are needy people all around us. And I pray that you would give us, give us the vision and give us the sight that we need in order to minister to those who you've placed in each one of our lives. Lord, to, to play the part, to be the part that you've put us there, to do that exactly what you've called us to be and to do, just like you put Esther and Mordecai said, God has put you here for just a time like this. Lord, you've placed each one of us in different people's lives, in different times, Lord, for just a time like this, to minister and to show the hope of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, may we take the confidence that we find, as Paul wrote in Corinthians, these truths to heart, and may we live out your truth this day and the days ahead. And Lord, as we think about this new year, may you go before us and lead us and guide us. May you protect our friends, Andrew and Leah, protect their family. Lord, may you go before them and may they see your presence, your guidance, Lord, your provisions in multiple and awesome ways, Lord. May, may they continue to be faithful to you and may you keep Satan far from them. And Lord, that the enemy, as he desires to, to seek and devour those who are close to you, Lord, we pray for their safety and their well-being, that they will continue to be faithful to your calling and to all that you have for them, Lord. May we walk in obedience as brothers and sisters this day and the days ahead. Lord, for your kingdom come, your will be done. And we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Andrew and Lee, I'm going to let you head to the back. Lord bless you. Have a great week. And uh, we look forward to worshiping here next week this time. Invite somebody to come back with you. <laughs>